Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, April 27th, 2023. It is great to be back with Susie Dodd of JPL. Susie, once again, wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Susie, we're going to pick up at the turn of the century, a moment of transition for JPL, of course. Charles Alachi uh, succeeds Ed Stone as director of JPL. So just to orient us in the narrative, when that transition happens, what does that mean for you at that period? Are you affected by this at all? Well, actually, uh, in 1999, June of 1999, I left JPL and I went back to Caltech campus. I actually worked at, at IPAC, um, the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center. And I got a job uh, on the Spitzer, in the Spitzer Science Center, which was on campus. So I was not there at the transition of the, um, because I think, when did, when did Ed Stone leave, 2020? I mean, I'm sorry, 20, 2000? Yeah. Was it 2000? Yeah, so I was, I had, I was um, on campus at that time. So as I think Ed retired from the directorship about maybe a year after I, um, moved to campus. Now, just administratively, is that considered, I mean, it's all Caltech, right? Is it a detail? Yeah. What does that mean when you are now at Caltech? Well, the way I look at it is there's sort of two different divisions of the same company. The company is Caltech. They have a campus division that is a, both a college, university, and a research center. And then they have a J, JPL, which is a division um, that primarily, you would say 100% really works for NASA, has an FFRDC. So um, it's, so the color of the paychecks is different, but the benefit packages are the same. You can keep your credit union account, um, all that kind of stuff. Tell me about so the circumstances. When you're working on campus, um, you're not necessarily following a lot about what goes on at JPL and vice versa. Tell me about the opportunity at IPAC. What was it? Why was it attractive to you? Um, I had been on Cassini at that time since 1993, I think. Um, so six, more than six years. I'm like six and a half years. And I was ready to do something different. And uh, it was good timing for me. My husband um, worked on campus uh, in the athletic department. Um, my kids were old enough that they weren't going to daycare preschool anymore. The youngest one was going to start kindergarten. So I, I didn't have to drop them off at the CEC up here by JPL for child care. And so it was good, it was good camp, uh, timing for me to try something a little bit different. It's not like campus is hugely different or, you know, I don't have to sell my house and move across country, I think. Right. but it was good. And, you know, and they had a, um, the Spitzer Science, I'm sorry, the Spitzer Project Office was at JPL. So the project manager for the Spitzer Space Telescope is at JPL, but Caltech ran the Science Center. Um, it's, it would be similar to the project management of the Hubble Space Telescope being at Goddard, but then there's a Space Telescope Science Institute that's separate from Goddard. So it's that, that type of model. Um, and I, they, were, they were hiring up down on campus and one of the, the hiring manager actually came from JPL. So he was familiar with that and they were looking for somebody to help them on the uplink side, like sending the commands to the spacecraft, which was an area I had worked on in, on Cassini and Voyager and Mars Observer. So it was definitely in my background. Um, Tell me about your responsibilities day to day. How was it different being on campus than at JPL? Um, well, so at, at JPL, you're mostly working with engineers, and at Caltech, you're working with scientists for primarily. Scientists and software developers, because the software developers are writing the code that the scientists want to use. Um, but when I, first, when I first got there, I was working um, in the Spitzer Science Center uh, in the uplink area, helping them um, build tools that would interface with JPL tools. Because JPL was still going to do the sequ uh, sequencing and the command, like like sending the commands to the spacecraft. JPL still did that. And JPL had to merge, they were responsible for merging any engineering activities with the science activities. So at the science center, you're just focusing on 
um, what target are you going to look at? How long are you going to look at it? Uh, what are the parameters of the instrument needs to be set to to look at it? That type of thing. Um, and building software that creates a template for any scientist all over the world to, to use to build an observation. Um, and so a lot of my, a lot of what I did was spend time um, iterating between Caltech and JPL actually, which, which I enjoyed quite a bit having just come from JPL and knowing the people working at JPL in the sequencing area. And then, so talking to them and then learning the science side down there um, and what they were looking for, kind of bridging that gap of, so that they could talk to each other. Being the, the, the dictionary or the communications translator between the two organizations. Susie, how well developed was the Spitzer Science Center by the time you joined? How long had it been in existence? Um, I didn't think about that. It was. Uh, it was. It had been a long. It had been there a, a while. You know, uh, uh, I would say five or six years. Uh, but a lot of that early, early part was with uh, maybe a couple dozen. Uh, managers and uh, scientists who are designing the processes and the architecture of how the science center would work. Um, when I got there, we were writing code and getting into the details of interfaces and that type of thing. So the architecture uh, was already there. It was it was more um, um, than um, doing the engineering to, to that that makes that architecture work. Now, having a science center associated with a telescope, how frequently does that happen? What's the bigger story of why Spitzer needed a science center? Well, that's actually very common, but it was something brand new to JPL. I think uh, Spitzer was probably the first, or they, I guess IRAS was probably the first telescope, but it was much smaller in scope um, for JPL. So. So Spitzer was the last of the four great observatories uh, in, in the infrared observatory. And um, uh, having a science center is, is really the organization that, that works with the scientists all around the world for, for both getting their proposals, giving them tools, telling them how to write proposals to use the telescope, um, running all the reviews of those proposals to see who is selected, um, and then um, working with the scientists to actually technically build those observations that they want to take. And, and then once that's all kind of set up in the sense that we have a, you have a, a pool of observations for six months, you, you pick out of that pool, you know, the software will pick out of that pool what observations it, it can do when based on the, um, constraints, um, and the spacecraft will execute them. And then the data comes back actually to the Science Center again. Um, and they do all the final processing um, maps and data archiving also at the Science Center. So it's really, it's the front end of the, a Science Center represents the very front end of a mission from working with the scientists in, in developing observations and the very back end where you're re receiving the data and then processing it and sending it out to the scientists to write papers with kind of thing and archiving it. So in the middle, this piece in the middle, which arguably is probably a smaller piece than the two outsides, the piece in the middle is the, is the piece that JPL does, which is um, turn those turn those command requests into sequences into ones and zeros send it to send it to the dsn have it come back from the dsn separate it into the right packets and then send those packets down to to um, ipac down to the science center that's that's a very standard process for te telescopes now was your hire as manager was was that influenced by the planned timing of the launch in 2003 uh, well, that's certainly what made the project staff up. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I knew we were, we were technically going to launch in 2002. Um, and then uh, that was the same year that uh, I think Spirit and Opportunity, one of the Mars missions, you know, my, my memory is not as good as your history, David. Uh, <laughs> one of the Mars missions um, needed a, the rocket that we were going to use. And so we got pushed out 
so that the Mars missions could launch. We got pushed out a year. Susie, what was your sense of the science objectives of Spitzer? It was, you know, a new era in, in infrared astronomy. What was it? What were its goals? Well, I think its goals were to see back in time, and um, which I guess is the goal of every, every telescope. But in infrared in particular, you can see through dusty objects. So um, you, can, you can see where stars are being created and born, the so-called stellar nurseries. Um, that was one of the keys, is, is understanding how star formation happens. Um, you know, it was really clever, and we can talk about this later, but uh, when we ran out of cryogen, um, we were actually able to repurpose the Spitzer telescope to get something like another 10 years of operations out of it. And one of the biggest things that happened was the, this whole discovery of exoplanets. Um, Spitzer, I think, was probably one of the first uh, flight-based telescopes to, to look at exoplanets and discover exoplanets. So, and that all happened in the extended mission. So, um, Now, yeah. was that part of, of Spitzer's program yeah. that they were... No, it wasn't part of the initial... Um, I mean, I'm sure some scientists thought about it that way, but it wasn't the sales pitch to NASA headquarters. We're going to go find exoplanets. It wasn't an exoplanet hunter the way the TESS telescope is now. Um, it was, a, it was a lot about stellar nurseries and star formations and um, galaxies and, and you know counting galaxies. How many are there actually out there? And there's techniques for that. So, um, Susie, how much of your previous work was translatable? Working on a telescope, in what ways is it different than than a planetary mission, for example? Um, well, for one thing, you work with a lot more scientists uh, and um, uh, and the science team changes. On a planetary mission, you've got, uh, you know, I'll just use Voyager, for example, right? We have five, currently five operating instruments, so there's five principal scientists. That's it. Those are the five people you work with. Yeah, on a telescope, um, you, you, you can work with anybody around the world, and you, there's a selection process for determining who's going to have time on the telescope, and that, that process is uh, a peer review of proposals. So, um, and you have to tell the scientists, you have to put out documentation um, so that any, any scientist can read it, understand it, understand how to put in proposals and how the instrument works and that type of stuff. So there's a lot of description of the spacecraft that you provide to scientists, but it could be scientists from any, anywhere. There's not really any set scientists um, that have control over the telescope. It's it's basically what gets selected is, is um, done by a peer review. So your peers think that your science is worthy to do on, on this telescope and, and take time away from potentially other observations. So it works quite a bit, it works quite a bit differently, but it is, it is very similar to, to any, like to Hubble, to James Webb, or to any ground-based telescope. Um, that's how all the ground-based telescopes work. Unless you're lucky enough to just own your own, which some private private investors do, and, right. and you can do whatever you want with it, I guess. Susie, who are some of the key people you worked with at Caltech on Spitzer, both among the astronomers and at IPAC? Um, well, I worked, um, you know, I worked with Tom, Professor Tom Sofer. He was the Science Center director. His deputy director was George Hallou. Um, so they were the management. Um, of the team. Bill Green was the um, Spitzer uh, Science Center manager. He's a person that came from JPL. He'd done a lot of imaging processing in the image processing group. He had been a manager there that got hired down to, to Caltech. Um, from a science perspective, um, I worked with uh, a woman named Lisa Story Lombardi, who has since left, but she she and I were teamed up a lot to develop the, me more on the engineering side and her on the science side to develop the um, uplink software and processes involved there. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other scientists. There were a lot of, well, there were, there, there were three instruments on Spitzer, so they each had um, a prime scientist uh, that worked with others, but there were three scientists, Bill Ladder, Kardec Chef and Bill Reach. Um, two of them are actually at headquarters now. They work 
for ESSA, the science mission director at headquarters, and I think the last one is up at um, Ames um, now. So they were the lead scientists, one for each instrument down there too. You mentioned you would go up to JPL with some regularity. What were the kinds of things that prompted you to go back on lab? Well, we would have meetings um, to talk about interfaces, you know, what, what kind of a product is the Science Center going to pass off to JPL? What, what, are the, what does JPL need, to, need in that information in order to use the tools they had? And then what type of a, what are the checks in that system? What's the timeline? You know, I need this by, by T0 so that I can send something to the spacecraft by T plus three weeks. We would have, um, so we had a regular process and then we also had a target of opportunity process. If some big solar flare went off or not a solar flare, but say a gamma ray burst, right? Or some of that, we just had the boat, right? The biggest of all time gamma ray burst just recently. But if there was a supernova or something like that, uh, they had a target of opportunity process where you could interrupt your plan schedule and turn to that target to take observations within a um, 48 hour period. And uh, and that's not actually that that's something that JPL is not real done. It's not done frequently with planetary missions. Everything's like really planned out and you just follow that schedule. So to have a process where you could actually interrupt it late in the game was was a little bit new to JPL. Um, and I think uh, the process of spending the time to explain to the engineers at JPL what we were trying to do based on the science and not and not uh, just speak down to them like, it has to be done this way because this is how we do it type thing. But yeah. you know, if you spend the time and you, and you, that's good advice for anything, but anybody, but educate the people you have to work with and then it'll probably be a lot easier to work with them. <laughs> Susie, what about the, the data analysis? How would you compare the, the amount of data coming in from a planetary mission versus a telescope? Um, I, think, um, I think they're similar, although tele, um, they're similar from the imaging standpoint. Um, but tel telescopes can create a huge amount of data. James Webb has a huge amount of data coming down, and the next large telescope will just have a huge amount of data coming down. Um, uh, in part because they're closer to the Earth, so it's easier to get large data volumes down um, from a Lagrange point mission than it is from Mars or Jupiter or something like that. But I think also, um, uh, you know, if you want a high resolution picture of Mars, that's a lot of data too. That's a lot of data. So um, in a lot of cases, there's the data volume pieces are similar. Um, what I think is different, a little bit different in, in an astronomy mission is you're really trying to pull the signal out from just the noise. So one of the, one of the techniques they do frequently in um, astrophysics mission is they stack images. You'll take, you'll take the same image a hundred times and you'll, you'll stack them up just to pull out one little feature that in an individual image you can't see, but when you have a hundred images and you've overlaid them, you can start to see that, that very faint dot really means something. So, and I don't think you do that a lot in the planetary missions. Susie, do you recall if anyone around that time was starting to think about machine learning and artificial intelligence as a tool to deal with all of this data? I mean, I'm sure they were. Um, there are actually some super clever Diana. programmers and, and data, you know, data scientists at IPAC. They, they actually, you know, one guy down there is, you know, has algorithms named after him, right? Certain, certain data processing algorithms are actually named after him. Um, I don't remember it being, um, yeah, I don't remember it being something that we spent a lot of time investigating, but I'm sure it was something that was sort of just just beginning to get uh, um, thought about more. And you know, once once the data is in the archive, the scientists can do whatever they want with it in the sense that they pull it out. They may do machine learning on it after we've made the final product. It doesn't mean that they can't 
continue to refine it. Just means that we've made our requirements to put this final final uh, product in the archive. Susie, being on campus, did that give you opportunity to work with graduate students or even undergraduates? Um, mostly postdocs, actually. There'd be people in IPAC who are postdocs. Um, maybe a couple graduate students, but not not the undergrads. I mean, it wasn't really. It's a research. You know, in essence, it's it's a research part of campus, not an academic part of campus. So, but there were postdocs in there, and they would do research on the. Um, on the data. Now, did you see this? I mean, there's a theme in your career, you know, five or six years and you want to do something new, right? Did you envision that you would stay with Spitzer for as long as you did? Um, no, not really. I think when I got there, it was just, you know, how long does it stay interesting? Um, but, you know, I, I, I advanced my career there too, because when I first came down, I was just an engineer in the organization. And then, um, I took over uh, being the um, science center manager um, from Bill Green. He ended he ended up retiring um, due to health issues before launch, and so I went from managing, you know, being an engineer, being a manager of a small group in the uplink system there, to managing <coughs> the whole Spitzer Science Center, which was 200 people by launch. So. And so, so I, I advanced my career down there as well. What was launch day like for you? It's exciting. And we were there uh, in the conference room, the big conference room at uh, campus. It was, uh, an, it was an evening launch on the West Coast, maybe 7 or 8.30 at night, um, which would have been more like 11.30 at night at the East Coast. I didn't get to watch it in person, but I, but I watched it um, with most of the rest of the Spitzer Science Center. Um, there and it's great to see it go off and be successful. Did you know that you would ultimately return to JPO? Or could you have envisioned a scenario where you would you would have remained on campus for your uh, career? Oh yeah, yeah, I could definitely envision a scenario when I remained on campus. Um, but, uh, you know, Spitzer went into an extended mission five years after its launch and um, there wasn't a lot more new things coming in at the time. So I, I wasn't necessarily looking to get back on campus, but they came looking for me, <laughs> JPL did. So um, when, there, when the Spitzer project manager retired, it was kind of clear that I could go from the science center manager to being the project manager. But the, but the position was at JPL, not at Caltech. And then they, um, at the same time, then the uh, Voyager project manager retired. So, so two of the main JPL project managers retired at the same time. And so they asked me if I could come back to JPL. And uh, this was in the 2010 10 time frame, if I could come back to JPL and um, do both projects. They're extended missions. Both of them are extended missions. So um, I said, I think I can. Yeah, I think I can. And so you said yes times again, two. It's another it's another growth in your career, right? You, you become a project manager instead of, you know, the mission manager or the science center manager. So, so for eleven years, as you explained, it kept you stayed because it it, it was interesting. It, you, it it kept your attention. Why? Why was it so interesting for so long for you? Um, well, the science was great. I enjoyed the people I worked with. Um, I got to travel more down there than I did any any place when I previously at JPL um, and um, you know it was fun it was fun seeing my husband at lunchtime and that was good it worked out family wise it worked out pretty well too um, so I think it I think you stay in a job as long as it's interesting and you feel like you're learning and you're growing something um, eventually uh, some jobs get to more routine and you'd like to go on and try challenge yourself in someplace else that's kind of what and then and then if the opportunity knocks you say that sounds pretty good i'll take it <laughs> susie being back at campus with ed stone you know going back at least as part of his responsibilities to being a, a caltech professor did you ever spend time with him did, did he ever share his views about his legacy as jpl director with you uh 
Um, not during the Spitzer's days, not, not during the 2000s when I was on campus, because I wasn't working on Voyager at the time. So um, I was only hearing little bits and pieces that, you know, it's still flying. Wow, that's really amazing. <laughs> that was a little bits and pieces I was hearing about. Uh, that and the fact that they, they, were, they were always fighting for a budget. But I didn't really interface too much with um, Ed at all uh, during that time period, no. What were you learning at, you know, firsthand or when, it, when you were there about, about what Charles Alachi was doing, what some of his big initiatives were? Uh, well, Charles is a radar guy. And, you know, I worked on Cassini and he was a PI for the radar on Cassini. So I knew him, I knew his background from scientifically what he likes to do, which is radars. Um, he had also spent a lot of time uh, previous to becoming um, the JPL director on Earth, Earth missions, um, like the shuttle-borne radar. He worked extensively on that. Um, so I, when he came on board, it was not, I would say, not surprising that he tried to get more um, radar and Earth-borne radar type missions going and, and to reach to, to, to expand between, expand beyond planetary missions into Earth missions. Not that Earth is not a planet, but typically that was the realm that Goddard did all the Earth observing missions and JPL did all the planetary missions. And that kind of changed in the 2000s. You know, Goddard got a planetary mission, we got Earth, Earth missions. And so it's probably healthier to have the competition between the new two NASA centers um, so that one's not always doing one type of science. So back now in 2010, there was not one but two project manager jobs for you to fill simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. So my predecessor on Voyager, uh, Ed Massey, is a project manager. He was always he had been half time for quite a while, so that job would that job was half time. Um, Bob Wilson, the Spitzer project manager, retired. I think that was more of a full-time job, but uh, they, they asked me if I could do it on a half-time basis, and so I said, I think I think so. I had a lot of experience with Spitzer, I think so, and, and do that half-time and do Voyager half-time. They're not related whatsoever, but um, they're both really interesting, but they have no relationship to each other at all. <laughs> so if you could explain just the titles, the nuances there, what it means. I mean, you're on Spitzer on campus, you return to, to JPL, it's a different title. What's the distinction? Oh, yeah. So in the, in the case of Spitzer, uh, the science, the Spitzer Science Center is run from campus. What's run at JPL is the engineering side of Spitzer and the project management. The project management is the organization that deals with headquarters and gets money for the whole project, whether the, that piece so, so the project manager, JPL, gets money from headquarters. Some of it stays at JPL, and some of it JPL sends to campus for the science center. So it sets the budget, the project management, and the project, project um, yeah, the project management basically sets the budget for the whole process, all, or the whole project, all the pieces of the project, no matter where they're located. Uh, so in this case, the JPL project office is responsible for funding the Spitzer Science Center. It might be funding um, people at Goddard to help with the proposal cycle calls. Um, there's a lot of just logistics that go around that, doing that. Um, so the, pro the project office is responsible for making sure all of those pieces of a project play together and get funded. And both missions, you said they, th these were extended missions. Right. So what does that mean, just administratively? Who makes that call? What's the significance? Uh, well, when a project is designed and NASA agrees to fund it, it it's, it's, has what they call level one requirements, science requirements. Uh, this is what must happen for the mission to say it's successful. Um, we've mentioned in Voyager's case, it was a flyby of Jupiter and Saturn with two spacecraft. That was the level one requirement. We. We are, we are a successful mission if we did nothing else after that. Now, Voyager is the extreme because it, Voyager 2 went to Uranus, <coughs> excuse me, Neptune, and then, you know, the next 30 years um, out into interstellar space. That's an extreme. But in Spitzer's case, it was an infrared telescope. It had a cryostat, so it had helium cooling the detectors. 
the prime mission there was two and a half years. In other words, the helium had to last two and a half years and they had to take a certain number of observations. Uh, it turned out that the helium lasted over five years. So they got nearly double a, a, a cryogenic mission, a cold mission. And then they were able to identify science they could do with uh, a warm telescope. And warm is relative, it's like 24 degrees Kelvin instead of five degrees Kelvin. But they figured out science uh, objectives they could do with a warm telescope. And they made a proposal um, to uh, NASA headquarters to continue operating Spitzer to do this warm science. And, and um, NASA said yes, agreed to it. And so extended missions are when basically missions finish their level one requirements, but are still operating very well and can continue to do more science. And, and you have to go to headquarters and you have to make a case for continuing the mission beyond its, its level one requirements. What was it like to be back at JPL? You had been gone for so long. Um, it was different, yeah. Um, uh, you know, a few different people or the same people in different jobs. You know, that was kind of, that was it too. Um, but it was great. I mean, uh, it was nice to see people, more people again. Obviously, I interacted with the Spitzer people that were up here. But, uh, you know, coming back to Voyager, boy, whew, that was like, 20 years later, and, and and all the acronyms still came back to my mind. Oh, I know what an <laughs> SFOS is, and I, I know what the CCS and the FDS are and what they do, and they're, um, you know, it's like, wow, they still use the same process, and they and, and the people were the same. That's, that was probably the biggest shock, because many of the subsystem experts, not that we have that many subsystem experts, but, but, you know, half a dozen of the people were there on the project when I left, and 20 years later, and they're on the project when I come back. Still doing the same job. Basically. Now, in theory, two half-time appointments, does that really become one full-time role, or is this really, you're operating, it's like 150% or even more than that? Uh, yeah, it's over one. You know, it, some weeks are better than others. You'll, you'll have a lot of work on one project and not so much on the other, and then it'll switch. It's, it's those, there's these time periods, like in the spring, where both projects are going through budget exercises and, and then it's kind of crazy. Then you then you have to support both of them at a high level. But in general, it, it's manageable. Now, both missions being extended, was Spitzer more surprising? Was Voyager built at that point? Was it assumed that it was on its way to interstellar space? And of course it would be extended. Was there any question about Spitzer being extended? Uh... So Spitzer um, had to come up with a very good science case once the cryostat ran out because its prime mission was, you know, it, it was all designed, the detectors were all designed to be cold. Um, and two of the three instruments um, do not operate warm or do not have any uh, science value when they're warm. So the only instrument in the Spitzer uh, extended mission is the infrared camera array. So we went from three instruments to two instruments. I'm sorry, two, three instruments to one instrument during the um, extended mission for Spitzer. But uh, it, it had come right about the time after we had um, discovered uh, the first of the exoplanets. And so that was, that was new science, and that was new science that we could continue um, in this warm mode. So I think that was a big selling point to NASA. How did the science change for Spitzer as a result of going down to one instrument? Um, you know, the scientists always get clever. I would say that. That doesn't matter whether it's a telescope or a planetary mission. They always get clever. And, you, and when you build these missions, you expect to have discoveries and things that you didn't know of or didn't think of before. So um, we... The uh, long wavelength instruments, so the instruments that are really going to see and peer through dusty star fields and things, that, that waned once we, um, once we went into a warm mission. We couldn't, we couldn't do that kind of science anymore. But we could do more of the um, near-term um, imaging type things. And particularly, one of the neat things that you can do with telescopes is you can take an image in infrared with Spitzer. You can take the same in, 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 image uh, with um, uh, Chandra uh, uh, telescope in, in the X-rays and you can overlay them 
and then you can use the overlay of the different wavelengths to pull out the feature in the in, in the um, image. And so we did a lot of that too. In other words, taking images with Spitzer, but then taking the same image with other telescopes in different wavelengths and combining them together to get a to get a whole image of a, su a supernova that describes then this explosion, which are, where are the x-rays, where's the infrared, you know, where's the heat source, that type of thing that you can see when you have multi-wavelength images. Being at JPL in a different role, what did you learn new about Spitzer? What, what simply was not possible to understand or, or work closely with from your previous role at, at Caltech? Um, I think we, I worked a lot closer. Uh, Spitzer, uh, the engineering team at Spitzer was partly at Lockheed Martin because they they built the spacecraft portion of Spitzer. Uh, Ball Aerospace built a telescope, but um, Lockheed Martin built the spacecraft that you know steers the telescope, right? So um, I worked. I got to work more closely with the team at Lockheed Martin. They were very good. Um, Spitzer was in a very unique orbit, what they call an Earth trailing orbit. So it would follow the Earth around the sun in the Earth orbit, but it kept drifting and drifting further away from the Earth. So um, that trajectory made it, uh, had the further, the longer the mission went, the further the telescope got away from the Earth. So the more, due to the trajectory, the more you had to be careful uh, downlinking to the spacecraft in the sense that um, the sun was becoming more and more of a factor getting into the bore of the telescope, which would heat it up, which you wouldn't want whatsoever. So there was a lot more during the extended mission. We spent a lot more time on the engineering side and with the Lockheed engineers um, to really to, to design how we to redesign how we do downlinks and and how frequently we need to do these type of things and any other kind of maneuvers just based on the, the geometry of the orbit changing. Now, going down to one instrument, was there a specific timeline for how long the mission, just technologically, how long it could last? Um, it was the, the, the driver to how long the mission could last was actually the geometry of the mission. Because eventually, eventually, the telescope gets on the, the earth and the telescope have the sun in the middle of it. So you can't, you can't uh, downlink the data through the sun. Um, so as it drifted away, it, you got shorter and shorter downlinks um, because you, you would have to get closer and closer to the sun. And you, you didn't want to heat up that bore, that telescope uh, bore site. So, so there were a lot of, there are actually a lot of changes done just to get a certain, some amount of data down and um and then you also have solar panels so you have to balance how you're charging that versus how 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 much time you need to charge versus when you go off the sun to to point at the earth how how much that depletes the battery um so there's a lot of there was a lot of engineering balancing and challenges and that's kind of really what's in the end caused the mission to end the science was still good but there was just not enough of it coming down to make it worthwhile because we were dominated the the geometry of the orbit um, kind of limited the amount of science we could get back. Now, are you surprised that Spitzer lasted as long as it did going all the way to uh, 2020? Absolutely. Absolutely. It didn't surprise me too much. I mean, obviously you made your level one, two and a half year requirement. Um, and, uh, so I would expect that. And you got five years, so you got almost double what you wanted. Um, but I think how long they were able to operate as a war mission, um, coming up with new science, exoplanetic science, and coming up with new uh, new geometries and new tricks uh, from an engineering standpoint to be able to keep all the subsystems between power and thermal in balance and still get data back uh, to the earth, you know, they, they were able to do that for another 10, 11 years. That's pretty remarkable, actually. <laughs> Very remarkable. Now you cycled off uh, Spitzer before the end of the mission in 2020. I did, I did about a year before. Uh, that's when um, I took over in the current role I have as the director for um, the Interplanetary Network. I, I cycled off of Spitzer. I was also on a project called New Star. At one point, for about three years, I had three projects I was project manager for. What years were New Star? 
Um, New Star launched in uh, 20, 2012, June of 2012. Um, so I guess I was on that for uh, four years. I think they just had their 10 year anniversary last year, I think. So, so that four, four and a half years, um, I came on right at, right at launch. Um, and, uh, Fiona Harrison is the principal investigator. She's at Caltech. Um, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, David, I kind of forgot what your question was, but <laughs> just, the whole part of it, you know, I, I, can, I can understand why you were, you were managing three projects at the same time. It's hard yeah, to keep track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You well, know, in 20, in 2016, Mike Watkins became the director of JPL right. and he made some, he made some, um, he made some changes. And one of them was to put me in as the, uh, director for the interplanetary network. And at the time, um, you know, Spitzer was Spitzer. I think the writing was on the was on the wall with Spitzer, and New Star was pretty routine. And New Star is a very small mission, small team, small mission. Um, so, um, but Voyager, had, I think, had always had my my heart. Yeah. Um, and since I started on it, so I asked if I could stay as the Voyager project manager uh, while doing this uh, directorate job. And you know, I had a couple people say that's too much, uh, but. Mike Watkins was willing to let me try it and um, been doing it ever since. So well, the it last... is a lot. It is a lot. I mean, um, <coughs> Voyager doesn't get easier. It only gets harder. Yeah. Uh, so Susan, the, harder. The, the last topic we'll cover for today, because obviously we want to talk more about your current role and, and, and New Star, bring the story right up to the yeah. present to wrap up for next time. But the last topic for today, of course, is when you returned to Voyager. So just, you know, emotionally, it was always close to your heart. What did it feel like to be back on the team? Um, it was great. I mean, I I was like, I hadn't really followed it that closely for the 20 years I was not on it. Um, uh, I got to, I learned a lot about, especially in the 2000s, how it was almost canceled and all the reviews um, that it had. So, and Ed Stone told me right away, he goes, well, you know, we're past the termination shock. We think we're getting close to the heliopause. So I don't, headquarters is not going to cancel us now, but they could bleed us to death in, in a sense. They could just keep cutting your budget and cutting your budget so you couldn't operate anymore. Um, he was very uh, concerned about that. Um, and fortunately, I was not on the project too long, maybe uh, just two years before we actually, Voyager 1 went in and cross the heliopause. So I I didn't have to do a budget exercise during that two year period or, or go back for an extended mission during that two year period. So that was kind of nice that my predecessor, Ed Massey, had done one right before he retired. Uh, but it was a lot of, you know, you got to keep these missions, including Voyager, in front of um, NASA headquarters. You have to keep them in front of the public. Voyager is very lucky because everybody in the public knows about Voyager. Right. And so it's it's an easy sell to nearly everybody, um, especially now the science is so unique. Um, traveling through uh, interstellar space and away from the sun and away from us, and how does that how does the plasma change? How do the magnetic fields change? It's you need that time strip in order to do the science, um, and nothing is going to get out where Voyager is for for multiple decades. Now, by the time, say, by realistically, the, time... the nearest term, it would be 30 years, realistically, for the quickest thing to get out there. Um, and um, um, and we have a lot of, you know, what makes it challenging is we have a lot of engineering challenges. How do you get that last little drop of power out of this spacecraft, out of this 1975 designed spacecraft? Um, what else works from 1975? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, like, I, like, I think uh, the, the, the joke was, I said, one, one guy was like, you know, we have a spacecraft that's operating from 1975. Not, not very many people have a clock radio that operates from 1975. That's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> or a car with an eight-track tape recorder. So, um, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, coming back to your original question, yeah, getting on Voyager, it was... It was a reacquaintance. It was fun. Um, I mean, it's still fun. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun. Um, 
but just, I was really kind of shocked how many people were still on the project and had spent 20 years on the project. And, you know, and, and these people uh, who have been on the project for 35 or 40 years or 45 years now, it's, it's been their whole life. It's been their whole life. Yeah. And, uh, um, Sometimes I have to remember that as a project manager when, um, you know, something, you know, we talk, we have a debate about how to do something and it'll, it'll say, we've never done it like that before. And I'll say, yes, but the goal is to keep it operating as long as possible. And, you know, this is what we need to do to keep it operating as long as possible. So, so really dedicated, I would say it's a really dedicated set of engineers. Susie, by the time you rejoined Voyager, as it was headed, the, the spacecraft were headed to interstellar space, did the, was the deep space network already upgraded at that point to the larger dish to accommodate the distance, or were you part of that planning? No, I mean, the deep space network, the last time it got upgraded for a larger dish was back for the Uranus encounter. So it was a long time ago. Um, that they went from the 64 meters to 70 meters. And the 70 and meters was sufficient? For the planetary, yeah. For all the planetary stuff it was. But you know, now, now everything we do is arrays. We can't, we can't, Voyager cannot communicate with one antenna. We need two antennas, typically. I guess for downlink, uh, since we're only 160 bits per second, um, we could use a 70 meter or we can use three 34s arrayed together. But we're, Voyager is, because of the distance, it's just a huge DSN hog. Now they've built, they've built what the DSN has done over time, starting in the, the late, late 90s, early 2000s, they've built 30, new 34 meter antennas. And you build multiples of those and you can array them together. If you array four of them together, you get the equivalent, um, uh, you're able to capture the equivalent downlink rate of 170 meter. And, and so you can work those antennas in any combination. You can put, you can do them solo like you do for most Mars missions, or you can put them together like you do for Voyager. Um, so it's, it's more versatile to have uh, multiple antennas that you can array together than just have one large antenna that for a lot of missions, it's too much. A lot of missions don't need that large antenna. So. so is arraying just, you know, mathematically, is that basically the equivalent? If you array two 70 meter dishes, is that giving you the equivalent of one 140 meter dish or how does that work? You know, it's, it's, uh, it, I can tell you the, the, um, it's what it, well, first off, we don't have two 70 meters antennas at the same site, but, but three, four 34 meters are equivalent to one 70 meter. Um, and so uh, it's not quite, it's not like a two for one. It's it has, it's a sort of an RO over square factor. And actually I don't really have it in my head, David, except for I know that that, that takes four 34 to be equivalent to a, um, to a 70 meter antenna. But obviously arraying is sufficient for the needs of the mission. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it like to work, you know, closely with Ed Stone again? Um, we got kind of reacquainted, but he was, he's great. You know, uh, I probably obviously, well, maybe not so obviously, but has a lower level engineer in my, during the planetary days, I didn't work that closely with Ed Stone. Right. I wasn't on the science team. Right. I saw him walk really fast by me, you know, in the hallway <laughs> or something. Um, uh, uh, but I work that closely with them. And then coming back as a project manager, I work with them all the time because we work on budgets and I would make, <clears throat> I make, uh, appointments, come down by his office and you know, on campus and tell him what was going on from an engineering standpoint. And we just, we would catch up probably on a monthly basis. And it was, it was great because he would pull out his science charts, what was going on with the science and explain it to me like I was, you know, in his class. So like my personal instructor telling me all <laughs> about great. the Voyager science data. So now by the time you, he's, he's very, he's very giving and he makes a lot of time yeah. for you and he, and he wants you to understand the science. So that was great. And by the time you rejoined Voyager, was it already clear? Was it on the trajectory to, to get to interstellar space to find the heliopause? Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, both spacecraft were because they had both crossed in the 2000s. I think um, they both crossed, um, uh, the termination shock, which is 
where the outflow of the particles from the sun go from supersonic to subsonic. Um, you know, they have to slow down when they hit this heliopause boundary, but they come off the sun at supersonic speeds. And then there's a, uh, what they call the termination shock where they slow down um, before they sort of get to the wall of the heliopause. Um, and they had crossed that, term, that termination shock, both spacecraft had in um, the 2000s. So we knew we were close. We knew we were getting there um, to the heliopause, but we didn't know exactly when. And just the timing, were you, were you back on staff for, for the transition point for both spacecraft? Uh, not for the termination shock, but I was for the heliopause crossing, yeah. I got on in um, like September of uh, 2010, and we crossed the heliopause in August of 2012 with Voyager 1. Now, so is it the years. kind of situation where you don't know where the heliopause is until the spacecraft actually get there? Yes, it is. And what you're looking for is a change in... Um, you're looking for a change in plasma density, you're looking for a, uh, a change in the energy of the particles that are the spacecraft is detecting. And you're looking for a change in the magnetic field. That, that last part, the change in the magnetic field, we didn't really ever see. It was very subtle. Um, so this is one case where the model of the heliosphere didn't match the actual in situ data. So really the experiment sort of upended the theory to some degree. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As it always does, right? As it always does. And, and it, it took us a while. We saw we saw two of the three signs we were expecting, but it took there was a lot of debate about whether we'd actually cross the heliopause or not, and whether we could tell the press we had crossed the heliopause. So there was a good eight months, I would say, of science discussion, both within the team and then looking at experts that aren't on the Voyager team, but are experts in helio uh, helio science to, to decide that, yeah, we can say we crossed the, the heliosphere, or we crossed the heliopause rather than outside the heliosphere. But it, that took like eight months um, to, to work through the science to say, yeah, we can announce this type thing. So, what so was, when we announced it, we said, oh, it happened way back here. <laughs> what was the tipping point for all those months of debate and analysis? Um, it was a, a lot to do with the plasma wave science instrument, it had seen, you could see um, a rise in the plasma density uh, from, from what we determined to be, the, and we kind of backtracked into it actually. The plasma wave subsystem, um, one is it's playback data, and we don't do playbacks that often. Um, so we have to wait like every three months to six months to get that chunk of data down and then look at it. Uh, but you could see in that data uh, how the, the density of the plasma rose and then it got flat, which is a characteristic of what you would think would happen just outside the heliopause. Um, and then you could also see it in the charged particle count right, right away where, especially on Voyager 2, we have the PL, uh, PLS instrument, it's a direct measurement of, of plasma and you can just see the particles go Meep just completely dropped out, so, um, the, and the density changed. Uh, so on Voyager 2, it was actually much easier because of the, the difference in the instruments to determine that we had crossed the heliopause. Did your day-to-day -day change when the spacecraft crossed the heliopause? Um, not from an engineering standpoint, no. We get to have a press conference, so that's, that's not an everyday thing. But, but the um, operations of the spacecraft, is there anything different? No. No, you still still send up the same same inst you know same sequences. Still do the same calibrations. Um, I think I think we did change, and this didn't happen right away. We changed a couple of the like the filters and power settings on some of the instruments just so they could count the particles that they're seeing in interstellar space um, better. It's like tuning. A couple of the instruments got tuned. The cosmic ray subsystem got tuned to the new environment we were in. But that, that's pretty minor, actually. Susie, last thread for today. When, when did the project team start to um, extrapolate for the, 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 the life of the Voyager spacecraft? When could you get a good idea of just how long the, the, the spacecraft can last? Um, well, it's interesting. I, I, 
We've, the, this team on Voyager has made a lot of decisions since the Neptune encounter uh, based on thinking that the mission would last another three to five years. I don't think anybody thought it would last 45 years. Um, and so if you, if you had known in 1990 when you started on the Voyager interstellar mission that you were going to last for another, um, you know, 30, 30 plus years during, for an interstellar mission, you would do things differently. You know, you might, and it's, it's, it can be little things. It can be little things like writing down how you do a process or a procedure because somebody new might have to come in and take over for you. If you always thought the mission was going to last three more years, you might say, okay, I'm going to stay on the project for three more years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, we've run across cases where uh, we've looked at documentations, like we wanted to change some fault protection. And the last time it was changed in, was 1990. And we'd say, well, why did you make it this setting why did you have this setting in 2010? And like, well, we thought that was way beyond this, how long the spacecraft would ever last. So we just, you know, picked a wild number and used that as the endpoint. Well, we're still going, and we need to we need to update that endpoint. Um, can you tell us how to do it? And a lot of times, they're like, nope, I don't remember. <laughs> but um, um, anyway, I think um, I think you would make decisions differently if you thought that the mission would last 30 years past Neptune or 32 years past Neptune. You would definitely, from an operational standpoint, do things differently. Um, but that said, uh, you know, the team that's worked with it for 35 years, it, it, they, they intimately know the spacecraft and they've been good stewards of it, right? They haven't taken risks. They've done the calibrations that need to be done and got the data back and there's and the spacecraft basically has been very well behaved on its own. Um, hasn't had any, you know, every once in a while we have a little blip anomaly or something, but not nothing super serious. And even if we have something which seems pretty major, like what we had last a year ago with the telemetry data from the ACS all garbled, you know, once we kind of figured out why, you know, why it got, or what happened to make it garbled from a, technical standpoint. We reset it and so it comes down just fine. So it's not it's not like a, it could have been serious depending on how it had happened, but it turned out not to be serious. So um, um, the more the more difficult challenges now are just do you make a flight software patch? You don't have a simulator to to test that on. So you're just counting on somebody's eyeballs. And this somebody is retired, but they're the only ones that know the spacecraft. Um, and you believe they're doing what's correct and you have other people inspect it, but it's not, it's not the same as having a simulator. So do you want to risk the patch in order to prevent this type of anomaly from happening again? Or maybe the anomaly won't ever happen again. It's only happened once on one spacecraft in 45 years. The risk is kind of epsilon, so you don't need to do the patch. It is those kind of decisions that we make frequently on Voyager now, and those are difficult. They're really difficult. You have to you have to play into, um, you know, the, the the trades you're weighing are whether you think this anomaly will happen again, because we've only seen it once in the lifetime of two spacecraft. Um, you know, what's the risk if it happens again? Could it, could you lose the mission? Maybe yes, maybe. Um, how difficult of a workforce is it to mitigate this risk? We don't have a lot of workforce and we don't, and we have not a lot of knowledge anymore. The original knowledge of the spacecraft and how it was built, is mostly gone. Um, and we don't have test beds or simulators anymore. So um, you know, if we were to build the commands and send them to the spacecraft, the only way we would know that the commands are right is just by your own eyeballs and inspecting the code you wrote or inspecting the code somebody else wrote. So it's a lot of different risks that you have to put together to make a decision. And um, that doesn't make it easy. It makes it hard and, and it makes it kind of a slow process too. Um, Cause you're really talking through things and weighing through things and getting a lot of different opinions from different people. Um, and even commanding Voyager is, and getting data back from Voyager is a slow process anyway. The data rates are low, uh, the distance is far, um, 
it, it takes a good week to, to kind of send something to the spacecraft, get the data back down, look at it, determine that it looks okay, and you may need to some, send something back up or you may not need to send something back out. That's a, a lot of missions can do that on one 80 hour pass. You know, we need a week to do that just because of the data rates and the, and the round trip light times. Susie, just to understand further, in gaming out the lifespan of, this, of the Voyager spacecraft, how much of that involves guesswork into just how much more power they have to give? In other words, when you look at the percentage on your cell phone, you have a pretty good idea how long it's going to last. Was there really that much guesswork involved in how long they could keep going based on the power system? Well, we know, we know how much power we have right what we can and we know how it's going to decay and we know that uh matter of fact i just got a chart uh yesterday voyager one has 224 watts of power and we need 200 watts just to run the transmitter okay just to run the transmitter that's not putting any data through the transmitter um so there's this 24 watt margin and um if we don't change anything then we know we know um, how long it will take to get to that point. Um, you can look it up, actually, uh, if that's of interest. It, it looks, I'll show you, David. Please. There's the plot. Oh, wow. And what you're seeing is, is the, the light colored curve that goes all the way to, the, to zero is just the half life of the plutonium. And then we, it's, it's very consistent. We march right down that curve at four watts a year as the plutonium decays. And um, we cannot change this curve. What we can fiddle with a little bit is, uh, in, is, is what we do to uh, draw less power in that sense. Um, like we, what we've done is essentially, um, you may read that story, there's a story online now, because we, we've gone to, it just came out yesterday, we've gone to uh, voltage management on Voyager 1, and what that means is we're going below, we're regulating the voltage instead of the power now, so it allows us sort of to use what you might consider a safety net of power, a, cu a couple watts, but if you go, um, if you're able to use those couple watts you know every two watts is six more months and um we're, we're really trying to 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 figure out how to kind of stretch out this curve so that the transmitter doesn't turn off at 200 it, you, you know maybe we can stretch it out down here um somehow <laughs> but that's that's all clever engineering physics is physics the decay will happen at the rate the decay happens right. but the clever engineering is to say well okay what else what else can we turn off and leave the science instruments on most important thing is to get the science on so finally susie last question for today i wonder at a certain point if you made a promise to yourself so long as you're able that you would stay with voyager for as long as voyager was operational you know, that's a tough question, Dave. <laughs> that's a very tough question. I probably have made a promise to try and get to 50 years because I want to be at that party. Um, am I the last project manager for Voyager? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that right now. But but it's it's understood that Voyager won't have power after 50 years. Or is that possible? Is it possible to oh, stretch no, it I, even more? Uh, no, no. I mean... Um, We'll have a 50th, 50th anniversary in four and a half more years. Voyager will certainly, at least one of those spacecraft, I think will certainly make it to that milestone. And you know, we're hopeful that as we turn off things and turn off things, we can, we can get to um, out to um, the 2030s and maybe even 200 AU. That's gonna take a lot of, of good fortune to happen. If I look at this chart, yeah, if I look at the bottom part, I don't know if you can see, the bottom part of this chart is, tw is 2032. So we should get to 2032 on Voyager 1. Wow. Whether I'm there still working as a project manager in 2032, I don't know. Okay, to be seen. <laughs> All right, Susie, thank you so much. We'll catch up next time. We'll bring the story right up to the present. Okay, very much. Thanks, David. Thank you.